Um, so there are three steps to the evalu evaluation of the, the CMB fluctuations. Initial conditions we calculated. Then those initial conditions have to be evolved forward through the primordial plasma. Um, that's what this transfer function T um, is, is, is doing for you. And so the final answer was that at linear order, we have this you know, product of initial conditions evaluated at early times and this transfer function that gives us the observed temperature fluctuations as a function of um, co-moving momentum K. Um, and so what we have to do next is basically just project this onto the sky and then we're done, okay? And that's not much, it, it's, the physics of that is really a, absolutely, um, yeah, it's just a mathematical exercise in, in spherical harmonics. So I'm not gonna belabor this, this too much, but just to give you some intuition for what, what we're actually gonna be, be doing here, this is a small animation by, by Wayne Hugh. So, so far we've calculated these fluctuations for a single plane wave. That's this plane wave that I'm indicating here, okay? And so this plane wave is oscillating before recombination, and then at recombination is basic, we're basically taking a snapshot of that plane wave, okay? And photons start free streaming after that time, okay? As soon as the universe becomes neutral, the photon starts free streaming, and you will see this in this, is this animation. And what, what's, what's plotted here are, you know, just randomly selected electrons that will scatter off the CMB photons, okay? And we, we got, we're gonna be sitting at the center of this, this simulation. An, or animation, and so basically electrons that are, and you will see that recombination is happening simultaneously throughout space everywhere, um, but there will be electrons that scatter off the photons too close to us, so those photons will have reached us, you know, before we, before the dinosaurs were getting extinct or something, you know, much earlier than that, um, and it's only a shell of photons that scatter at exactly the right moment such that the, they reach us at, at, at today's time, okay, so this is what we're going to be, be seeing, so you see the, the plasma oscillating, then recombination happens, these photons start free streaming, and we're observing precisely a, a shell of, of photons coming from a very precise uh, um, distance from, from us, okay? Corresponding to precisely the 13.8 billion years of, of, of evolution. And you can already see how even a single plane wave creates these anisotropies on the sky, angular variations of, the, of hot and cold spots. Um, even just for a single, single plane wave, those, those, that plane wave structure gets gets translated into an angular dependence on the sky. And now if we have many plane waves and we add these many plane waves, of course you can imagine how you get a much more complicated angular dependence on this, this surface of last scattering. Okay? So this is, this is what we now have to do mathematically. It's not very hard. So first of all, we can define a real space temperature field just as the Fourier transform of the solution that we have found. Um, here, just to indicate the geometry, the plane wave has a wave vector. In a flat universe, uh, the distance to the surface of the scattering is just given by the, because light travels at, a, at the speed of light, um, it's given by the difference in the conformal times. In a curved universe, there will be extra signs and, and, and cinches that in, that, in that relationship. Okay? Um, so now if we assume that this, this shell here is infinitely thin, okay, that, that recombination is happening instantaneously, that instantaneously the universe goes from ionized to neutral, um, then we can determine this shell by simply integrating over radius and localizing the surface of last scattering by a delta function. Okay? If there's some width to the surface of last scattering, then we actually replace this delta function by a Gaussian or some, some more smooth, smooth function. But if we make this delta function approximation, which turns out to be pretty good, it's just getting the small scales wrong again by a little bit. Uh, it's just affecting the damping tail. Um, if we do that, we can take our original solution, um, plug it into here, um, and we now get this, X, this, this, this e to the i k, k x evaluated at the surface of, of last scattering, integrated over all of the, the, the k modes. Okay? Um, and so now then the only thing we have to do is we have to take this and expand it in spherical harmonics. Okay? So you could either do this brute force by just you know, multiplying this by the complex conjugate of a spherical harmonic and integrating over angle and using the fact that they are orthogonal basis functions. Okay? You could either do that. Or you use this trick, this, this Rayleigh plane wave expansion, where you expand the, this, this plane wave into a product of these spherical harmonics and just extract the coefficient of the, the coefficient basically of this, this spherical harmonic basis function. Okay. And so I leave all of that to you as an exercise because it's not very interesting. It's just a, you know, it's just a mathematical, it's just algebra. You can, in my notes, you can see the steps if you if you're unsure. Um, but then what you will find if you then extract those multiple coefficients and calculate the, the average of the square, the power spectrum of that, you should find this expression. Okay? 
And that's a very nice answer, I think, because it really shows you um, what's going into calculating this, 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 this power spectrum. So we have a factor of the initial conditions here. That's the original power spectrum, the scale invariant power spectrum from inflation that we were calculating. That gets multiplied by, unfortunately, this is also called a transfer function, <laughs> okay? Um, by a transfer function that now has two pieces. It has this evolution piece, which was just this, you know, function t of k that we had originally. And then it has a Bessel function that comes from the projection. Notice that in this is Riley plane wave expansion, we have this Bessel function j of l, okay? And so that Bessel function is basically mapping a plane wave k mode in three dimensions into a two-dimensional multiple moment mode um, of these spherical harmonics, okay? Um, so all you have to do in order to co compute in practice, just as a, as a, and to calculate then from the initial conditions the CMB fluctuations is multiply by the transfer function, multiply by the Bessel function to get the projection, and that will tell you how these things are related, okay? Um, and in fact, this Bessel function is nothing really mysterious. If you look at actually what this Bessel function looks like, so here I've plotted the Bessel function squared as a function of its argument, okay? And you'll see that it has a, um, has a pronounced peak um, when the argument is, of, is, is equal to just the value of the multiple moment L, okay? And in fact, that peak gets sharper and sharper for larger values of L for smaller scales. So on, especially on small scales and even on, on intermediate scales, this Bessel function just acts like a delta function. I'm integrating over this Bessel function there's a lot of oscillations here that wash, you know, that get averaged out when I'm doing the integral, and I'm just picking out, picking up this first peak, and so I'm just mapping one to one, one k mode to one l mode, yeah, um, related by this distance to the surface of last scattering r, okay, r, r, r star. Um, this, this thinking about this as a delta function is really very good up to, you know, it, you can see at l of 10 it gets a little bit worse, and for the lowest multiple moments this Bessel function is quite wide, and it, it actually mixes you know, many K modes to one L modes and vice versa. Um, but except for, for those very largest scales, you can always just think of this as a remapping from K space to L space one to one. Okay? Um, and so, all right? Yeah? Mm -hmm. It was also, no, it was, it, importantly, it was encoding that different wavelengths oscillate with different frequencies. You know that, remember the frequency of that plane wave depended on k. It was a sound speed times k. So if the sound speed is, this, the sound speed is k independent, but then this k, uh -huh. small wavelengths will oscillate faster. Uh -huh. So they will go through more phases of oscillations before they get captured. Uh -huh. And that's why this, this transfer function that I was uh, here, showing here, this is now plotting this oh, transfer function as a oh, function of k. Okay, okay, okay. And it I comes see. from having these different plane waves oscillating at different amounts and then capturing them, taking a snapshot. I understand. Okay, um, thank you. So it's okay. So that was the transfer function. Then the projection is just a delta function selecting for one given k mode uh, a, a given a given l mode. So very roughly, you then get this, that this power spectrum is simply taking the the three dimensional power spectrum times this three dimensional transfer function and evaluating it. You know when this condition condition holds, okay? Um, okay, so that's, that, that's everything. We have computed the, the power spectrum of CMB fluctuations from first principles. Um, and if you wanted to, to embellish this calculation and make it more accurate, all you do is you change the transfer function T of K. Yeah? Rather than getting this transfer function from my simple estimates of a cosine and, and so on, you would just you know, go to CMB fast and actually compute it more, more honestly. But nothing else changes because we just this, I, I was writing it very abstractly in terms of just initial conditions times some arbitrary transfer function that will depend on the sophistication of your, your, your estimates or the, your calculation. Okay. okay, so let me just quickly summarize um, what we have done so far and also just use this as an opportunity to, to show you a couple more instructive plots, I think, to understand the physics of how these quantum fluctuations become classical fluctuations. Um, so what we have done is we have looked at quantum fluctuations on very small scales. Um, and during inflation, the, the, the Hubble radius, or what we sometimes call the horizon, is constant, okay, as a function of time. And then after inflation, after reheating, this Hubble radius grows with time. And so what that means is because physical wavelengths get stretched, you know, you know, by just one factor of the scale factor, if they start on very small scales, they have to at some point cross the Hubble radius during inflation. That's what we call horizon crossing. After that time, there are super horizon modes that are frozen, 
So that's this phase here. Okay? And then they, have to re they will re-enter the horizon because the horizon will grow faster than A after inflation. And they become sub-horizon modes and start evolving, start oscillating the way we were calculating, calculating it. Okay? Um, so at this time of horizon crossing, that's when this, these primordial classical fluctuations get imprinted. At that moment, we should think of this as a featureless power spectrum, like this. And I've indicated here four different wavelengths, basically. A corresponds to the longest wavelengths, and B, C, and D corresponds to smaller wavelengths. And you can see in K, of course, the longest wavelengths corresponds to the smallest K mode, and that corresponds to the lowest L in the, in the CMB fluctuations after, after the evolution. Okay? Um, and, and so this error here is the error that comes from the evolution and you know, computing the transfer function. So here I've just given you the references of basically CMB fast, which is one code to do this, and CAM, which is the second code to, to do this. Okay? But because we, this, this physics is atomic physics, there's nothing uncertain or speculative or yeah, we really understand this error, and because we understand this error, we can reverse it. Okay? Um, so as beautiful as the structure of the CMB is, and it teaches us a lot of things about the late time, you know, the composition of the universe, how much matter variance and dark energy there is. Um, you know, as, you know, if you want to use it as a tool for early universe physics, we typically reverse this error. We're actually un undoing a lot of that evolution, and then we have, to have a hope of actually studying this, this primordial spectrum. Um, you know, at, at these times rather than uh, after the, the processed uh, fluctuations. Okay? So that's just what I want to show you um, with, the, with the CMB data, how this, how this works out. Um, but actually, to f before showing you the, the present data, I think it's worthwhile because some of us um, maybe have been spoiled by the you know, WMAP data and Planck data and so on, so we, can't, we can hardly even remember that the CMB you know, you know, hasn't been measured as great as it has been measured. Is, is measured today. So I, think I find this plot kind of interesting to see that just 15 years ago, that's not yeah, um, uh, a fraction of our lifetimes. Yeah. Um, that's, what the, that's what the data looked like. That was just before you know, WMAP came online. And so you can see that you really have to be a believer to, to you know, to, to, you have to squint and then know that these peaks have to be there to really believe that this, 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 this worked out that, this way. Um, so a lot of error bars and different models, they could all still fit, fit the data in some sense, okay? Um, so that was 15 years ago, everything that, it, that existed, and so today it looks, it looks like this, okay? So it's quite dramatic how experimentalists can do things, I think, in just, just 15 years. Um, and in particular, this plot, in fact, now, this data has become so good, you can see that, you know, there's so little deviations from the best fit and the, and the, and the data points that this, this, this CL plot here has kind of become uninformative. Yeah? Um, and so they have added, for the first time, Planck has added a new plot where they look at residuals, deviations from the best fit, in addition to just showing that plot, to actually see how things, you know, maybe in the, how things deviate from the, from the best fit line. And it's more informative to look at this than rather at this. This is just impressing on you that it's perfect. And if you want to search for some little hints of something deviating, you go down and look here. And originally people thought, oh, maybe there's a dip of there was something here that actually is going away now, I can tell you. Um, and you know, stuff, stuff here, maybe not really fitting so well. Okay. Um, okay, let me also explain that because it's also an important point. So actually, you, see, may, you might be able to see these there's gray, gray points. Okay? So gray points are the individual multiple moments. You see, so those, there's actually a lot of scatter if you look, just look at the, at the gray points. And so to get this impressively looking nice fit to the curve, um, you're actually binning tw 20 multiple moments at, at a time, I think. Yeah? And then the error bars, of course, go down, and you get, yeah, you get much closer to the, to the best fit line. So that's, that's the first thing going on, that these are the gray points are the individual multiple moments, the blue points are, are binned, um, and then error bars, I believe, will be one sigma. I don't, I'm not Sorry? Yeah, so it's true, the low L, um, as in WMAP, that's another thing to emphasize, yeah, up to L of 500, yeah, the data is actually cosmic, WMAP already was cosmic variance limited, yeah, so the error bars on the larger scales are just coming from the fact that we have a finite number of multiple moments to estimate the CLs, 
And, and so there's an intrinsic error bar just from the, coming from the fact that we have a single realization of the sky that we're looking at. And there's a square, you know, there's, a, there's an error, cosmic variance error just associated with that. That's much bigger than the sensitivity error in the statistical error of my experiment. And since they're looking at the same sky, below 500, there's no difference between W map. There's no difference between W map and Planck. There shouldn't be any difference. Okay? Um, so it's true, W map already saw that there was maybe a little bit of lack of power on large scales. Planck has confirmed this. If it hadn't confirmed it, it would be a, one of the two experiments would have just been a failure. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but okay, that, that discussion has been ongoing, and so I have nothing to, nothing to add. Yeah. First realization and the fact that it's, um, you know, therefore uh, systematic, uh, yes. limited. I mean, uh, etc. Yes. Just a little bit, maybe in the discussion, if you like. I don't want to. I'll try quickly now, and if it's not comprehensible, I'm happy to expand. It's an important um, conceptual. It is point important conceptual so. because, yeah. yeah, in the end, it comes back to what we were saying yesterday in the sense that we're never predict predicting, of course, a deterministic sky. We're predicting the variance of these fluctuations, which means that these theta LM LMMs, the, the, the multiple moments, the way we should think of those is they are draw drawn from some probability distribution. And in this linear approximation that we were doing, is we, they're drawn from a Gaussian distribution with some variance. And the variance is what we have calculated here. But then we're looking at one realization, the universe is one realization of that the random, random process. Um, and But we're measuring a finite number of these multiple moments. So there's an error associated with our estimate of what the variance is, is going to be. And that error is, as you remember, the um, So the, the way I've defined the power spectrum last time was as this 1 over 2 uh, plus 1, an average over these magnetic quantum numbers, and that 2L two, two plus 1 of them. Uh, I stepped on something. OK. OK. So if we, and then, so we're basically measuring this from one realization of the sky. We're squaring it and then taking the average. And at low multiple moments, at low Ls, we only have 2L plus 1 of them to estimate the CL. And at high multiple moments, we have more of them. And so our errors go down because we have more data points to basically estimate that single number. Okay? And then, so that's why when you, did, when you look at this, we have very large error bars over here. And they become almost unrecognizable as we go to, to smaller scales. Okay? So that's, that's, that's cosmic variance. Okay, um, and so then this best fit curve, this red line here, um, has six free parameters. So there's six dials that we can we can choose to change that curve. I showed you last time what the physics is of these different dials, um, and so we can change that curve by changing the the parameter these six parameters, or by fitting the data to the to by fitting this curve to the data we can determine these six parameters. And so basically there there are four parameters for the background. Basically, four parameters that affect the evolution of these, these modes, and two parameters for the perturbations or the, the initial conditions. Okay? So the initial conditions, for example, have an amplitude, and if they're nearly scale invariant, they also have a tilt, if there's some power law dependence that is close to, close to one, but we also expect to be a little bit away, away from one. And then the evolution depends on baryons, matter, dark energy, and then there's an astrophysical parameter that I don't want to get into too much. It's called the optical depth. It depends on the the ionization of the universe after the first stars have formed. Um, and that's just something you have to put in because it, it uniformly damps the CMB fluctuations. And so there's an expert, there's, a, there's, the, there's that you have to add, okay? Okay, so there are these four, four parameters that you, did, that, that you can determine. Um, but once you, once you fix these four parameters, as I said, you can then take, undo the evolution, go back to the initial conditions, and, and, and study initial conditions. And so that's what I want to focus on just for the purpose of this school. You should invite somebody else to talk about the rest of, of Planck. Uh, <laughs> but um, so in, in, in especially the fact that we now have this incredibly precise data on this very large range of scales from a single experiment you know, allows us really to do this reconstruction of the initial conditions much more precisely and with more confidence than we, than we did that previously. Um, and just I like this kind of way of illustrating that how even the single plot of just the temperature power spectrum it's teaching us a lot of things about the initial state. Okay? So it's teaching us, for example, as I said last time, it's teaching us about the geometry of the universe. 
first, the position of the first peak in particular tells us the universe is flat. Um, the fact that we can express everything in terms of these multiple moments L and don't have to do some more complicated decomposition you know, basically also teaches us that the universe is isotropic statistically. The fact that these fluctuations are 10 to the minus 4 and not much bigger means that the universe is homogeneous. Okay? Um, then the fact that, as I explained last time also, the fact that we see these, these wiggles in the first place and not something more noisy um, tells us that the fluctuations, I didn't really explain that, but they are adi so-called adiabatic fluctuations and have coherent phases. Okay? Um, the fact that this power doesn't drop to zero but extends even to the very lowest multiple moments tells us that they're super horizon fluctuations at, at recombination. Um, and then if we undo these, also these wiggles which just come from plasma physics, um, we, we see that the, the initial spectrum really is very featureless and, and nearly, nearly scale invariant. Um, and then the fact that we could represent everything by a power spectrum and didn't have to include higher order correlations means that the fluctuations are to a high degree Gaussian. Okay? So these are a lot of very detailed features of the initial conditions that we can read off just from, from, the, from this plot alone. And so I want to focus, just say a few more words, and Leonardo, in fact, this afternoon or maybe tomorrow will say much more about um, actually searching for deviations from this, this, this Gaussianity. So I won't say so, so much about this, um, but I want to say a little bit about scale invariance. Okay? Um, so first of all, I want to actually emphasize that inflation was predicting two things about the, the, the scale dependence of the spectrum. So it, first of all, expect, you know, it, it predicts that these fluctuations should be nearly scale invariant. And the reason it should be nearly scale invariant is because we were, as I explained to you last time, we ex we're calculating these fluctuations when they cross the horizon. And they get an amplitude that is dictated by the expansion rate at that moment of horizon crossing. Okay? But since that expansion rate, by definition, is very slowly varying with time, yeah, these different moments of horizon crossing you know, the, you know, share very similar physical characteristics. And any scale dependence only comes from any, you know, a time variation in the conditions at horizon crossing. Okay? So if the, if, the, if the conditions were identical when, every, when the different modes are crossing the horizon, then the, the spectrum would be exactly scale invariant. Okay? Um, so we expect it just by the definition of inflation, because there's a time translation symmetry during inflation, we expect it to be nearly scale invariant. Okay? But importantly also, it would be as a disaster if the fluctuations have been found to be exactly scale invariant. So they shouldn't be that either, because exactly scale invariant means an exact time translation symmetry, which then means there's no evolution, there's no way of ending inflation. And just by the fact that inflation occurs and ends, there has to be some dynamics. And so you want to see some deviation from perfect scale invariance just because this energy density has to be slowly decaying rather than staying exactly constant. Okay? And you can quantify this if you have this expansion rate as a function of time. You can calculate um, this devi expected deviation from scale invariance. It's proportional with this one contribution coming from the first derivative, one contribution coming from the second derivative. This is basically the epsilon parameter. This is the eta, eta parameter. Okay? Um, and roughly you expect these, both of these parameters to be one over the number of e-foldings of inflation in some, in some sense. In. Okay? So you expect some deviation to indicate that there's dynamics during inflation. And so this is precisely one of the big discoveries I think that, that Planck has made is to, with a single experiment, without having to combine with external data sources, to actually really at high confidence now actually indicate this percent level shift uh, from the perfect scale invariant condition. Okay? Um. Okay, and this is now, actually I didn't even, this is now a six sigma, uh, basically a six sigma result. Okay. Um, okay, then also this plot, so what I've shown here on the y-axis is the ratio of tensor fluctuations to scalar fluctuations. So something I didn't show you is that tensor fluctuations also contribute to the temperature fluctuations in the, in the CMB, okay? And they have a different shape than the scalar fluctuations do, and therefore by using precisely fitting to the shape fluctuations just from the temperature power spectrum alone, and so that's what you're seeing here. It's a combined uh, constraint on the tensors and the scale dependence on the of the, the scalars, and so you see that you have constrained already tensor, the tensor amplitude to be less than 20%. Um, and in fact, you can show that this is the best you will ever be able to do with just temperature information alone. Okay? So if you want to measure tensor fluctuations better than this, now you have to go to a different, uh, different method of actually detecting them. Yeah. Sorry, what? 
the gray, the gray contour. So this is, this is just uh, 1 and 2 sigma. Yeah. Um, so 1 and 2 sigma, and, and usually we should at least be talking about 2 sigma. <laughs> um, and so usually I, I would, yeah, you should look at this, this, this second curve. Okay. Um, and, and then you can compare this to, of course, individual slow roll models. So I've, I've, I've plotted a, a couple of representative ones here. So these are chaotic inflation time models with just monomial potentials. Um, you can see some of them are ruled out because they produce too large tensor fluctuations, even for the, even for the level of tensors that, that we can constrain now. Um, some of them are marginal, like m squared phi squared, for example. So this, is, this one is one to watch um, because it might soon be ruled out or you know, something might be discovered at, at this level of sensitivity. Um, and there are other things like natural inflation, things that come from axions, which are also widely constrained now. And I'm going to talk about those tomorrow a little bit more. Um, then there are a large class of things with very small tensor amplitude that are un unaffected by these tensor constraints. Um, there's this original Starobinsky model of R squared corrections to Einstein Hilbert that lives down here. Okay. Um, yeah. That it is close to one. Hmm. Is there any physical significance that why is it close to one? I mean, is there any constraint, theoretical constraint coming from somewhere? That, that it's close to one? Yeah. Well, this is what I was trying to explain. I think it's, you know, it's close to one by the very definition of inflation. So perfect, you know, NS equals to one corresponds to a symmetry. It corresponds to time translation symmetry during inflation. So all physical quantities, energy density, expansion rate, you know, the, the speed of the inflaton field, all of those things, if they're perfectly independent of time, you have time translation symmetry. Yeah? And that means that all horizon crossing events for all the different wavelengths are identical. And since at those different moments, the different wavelengths get imprinted their power, um, as I showed in this, this, this curve earlier, um, you would get scale invariance. Yeah? So scale invariance really translates to a symmetry. It corresponds to time translation symmetry during, during inflation. Okay? 9, 6, whatever is the value, that is the Planck data. Yeah. Okay. So, these, these contours are, yeah. The, so the Planck data you know, tells us that these models have to live within these this confidence. Okay. Confidence. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. No. Uh, sorry. Uh, indirectly, there is because you can do a wild rescaling. So if you have R plus R squared. No, no, no. So if you have non, if you have non-Einstein gravity, uh, we, I can show you in detail. But it's just you can you can you can read a, you can do a binary scaling of the metric to make it Einstein-Hilbert, yeah, plus a scalar kinetic you know dynamical scalar field with a potential, and then it, we shouldn't even because you might even ask how do I do the slow roll analysis of you know R plus R squared. The easiest way to do it is to first do this conformal transformation, um, and then analyze. You know, this you know slow roll model coupled to Einstein Hilbert. Einstein Hilbert. Um, okay. Um, interestingly, maybe just to say this R squared. So there, there's there's lambda phi to the fourth living up here. Um, if you couple lambda phi to the fourth non minimally to, to to the Ricci scalar with a phi squared R coupling, even with a very small non minimal coupling of just a, of order a percent, say zero point. You know, if you have what I mean is this coupling. C phi squared r. If you imagine you have lambda phi to the fourth, which is naively ruled out, and but together with this coupling, um, you know, at, at c equals zero, lambda phi to the fourth lives up here. And if, if you're now allowing for a finite c at a c value, I think of just you know 0 0.01, it starts pro already coming inside of these contours. And at a c value of, of approaching infinity, it actually coincides with Starobinsky. So as, you, as you're changing C, it continuously connects between lambda phi to the fourth and, and the Starobinsky model. Okay. Interesting. Actually, you would think so. This is precisely the term that usually gives you the either problem. This is what people do in Higgs inflation. Maybe John is going to talk about it in his lectures at some point. Um, in Higgs inflation, in fact, they do. They have at large VEV, they have lambda phi to the fourth, um, which you think naively is ruled out. But then they also introduce a non-minimal coupling like this. For large values of the non-minimal coupling, yeah, 
it, um, you actually re have to reanalyze. You can't think of this as slow roll with this as a perturbative correction, which gives you the ether problem. It completely changes your dynamic and it actually flattens the potential at large wave. And so, so it's it's we can talk. About, it's a, it's, that's a, and then there's a subtle story about uh, unitarity and corrections and stuff like that. We could. Okay. Um, okay. So just a few words um, about Gaussianity, and Leonardo is going to say much more about this. So I'm not going to say anything. I just want to impress on you how Gaussian the CMB really is. Um, and when Leonardo quantifies to you what non-Gaussianity means, you will see, I think, a little bit more clearly what I mean by this. But let me just, as a statement, tell you that Planck has shown us that the CMB is Gaussian to better than 0.1%. You know, okay? um, so when we, when we are impressed that the universe is flat, for example, we only know that the universe is flat to 1%. Okay? But we know that it's Gaussian to better than 0.1%. So the universe is more Gaussian than it's flat. Okay? Um, so it's incredibly Gaussian. And whenever we now talk about non-Gaussianity or measuring non-Gaussianity, we're really talking about tiny variations around this Gaussian distribution, okay? less, than, less than a percent, okay? um, which you know, would be a very interesting deviation, of course, from, from Gaussianity. Um, and it's also something to be expected from slow roll, yeah? since if in slow roll you're moving down a you know, very flat potential. So by definition, self-interactions in the field are very small. And any non-Gaussianity is just coming from self-interactions. Yeah, if you turn off all of the self-interactions, you're just studying a free field, and that's effectively what I was studying uh, yesterday. Um, but a free field, of course, has a Gaussian wave function and therefore produces Gaussian fluctuations. So in order to see any deviations from Gaussianity, I would have to go to higher order, uh, study self-interactions in the field, but by, slow, by the slow roll conditions, those self-interactions are, are very small. Okay? So for single, you know, for single field slow roll, you'd actually expect those things to be more Gaussian even than this. Um, but of course, Leonardo is going to tell us that there are extensions to, to slow roll, either by having more complicated interactions in the inflaton sector, or by coupling the inflaton sector to other sectors. And, and so, I'll not say more about this because he's going to do it. Okay. Any any questions about about this? Yeah. Which which one? This one. Oh, this is just by, it's not a, it's not a, nothing. I mean, the convex and concave just means whether the potential at the time when you're observing the CMB fluctuations is bent this way or that way. Okay. Okay. So one of them is called a convex shape, another one is called a concave shape, and it, it changes the sign of the eta parameter because the second derivative of the potential is different. So it just tells you that up here, that, you know, from the slow roll formulas. The sign of eta is, is, is positive, and then down it's, it's negative um, below, below, below this line. Um, and there's some ambiguity, actually, what you call convex and concave. Um, Lee McAllister was obsessed about, obsessed about this, so actually changed the labels, because he doesn't agree with what Planck is calling convex, concave and convex. If you check Wikipedia, anyway, let, let me not get into it. But <laughs> yeah, this is, yeah, yeah, that's what I think so. But, but actually, if you check, there's actually in mathematics, you can even call it something convex up and convex down, and so it's not, it's not a totally, totally straightforward. Anyway, um, if you know Liam, you can you can spend an hour with him discussing this. Um, okay. Okay. So this finishes lecture one. <laughs> so, so let me switch now. Unless there are any more, any more questions to, to this. OK. So don't worry. Lecture two is much shorter. In fact, it's not even a full lecture. So I'm, I'm still OK in time, if not, if not great. <laughs> um, so I now want to switch gears a little bit and talk more about particle physics and, and the actual physics, physics of inflation. Okay? Um, so so far, this really was you know, a, lot of, a lot of cosmology, and now we want to I want to step back and go back to even earlier times and ask, you know, what could have created, created, created inflation? Um, and so necessarily this will become more and more speculative because, you know, of course these CMB fluctuations are just scientific fact and what I'm talking about now is not fact but is, it's trying to, trying to uncover some of these, these, these mechanisms for, for inflation. Okay? Um, but actually in this, in, this, this, in this part I want to do something very conservative. I just want to ask, you know, how does inflation fit into the most general framework of effective field theory that we can, we can, we can imagine. 
where we don't have to assume very much about the UV degrees of freedom. We're just parameterizing into typically our ignorance about, about UV physics. Um, and so I just want to show you how sensitive or not inflation is to our assumptions about the, about the UV. Okay? And that would then also naturally connect us to discussing this in the context of, of string theory. Um, so this is the outline to this, this part of the, the course. I want to give you just a very brief review on, on effective the field theory just generally, independent of, of cosmology. Um, and if this is something that is known to everybody, then just tell me and I can do this faster. Okay? Um, but I thought, at least for myself and my students and so on, it was useful for them to give, you, give them a refresher of some of the concepts. And in particular, I want to highlight just some of the things that are relevant for, for, for inflation. Then I'm going to apply these concepts to inflation, and then I'm going to discuss and show you, in fact, that inflation is very sensitive to what we do assume about the, about the UV. Um, and that will motivate actually studying it in the context of a more UV complete theory. OK? Um, OK, so if effective field theory, what is it? Um, so first of all, effective field theory starts with the realization, very basic. If you just look at nature, um, it comes with many different scales. Okay? So we have phenomena happening at short wavelengths um, or for very you know, massive or high energy states. And we have phenomena at long wavelengths and, and light states. Um, and luckily, we don't have to treat all of these phenomena at once to understand physics at, at low energy. Okay? Um, otherwise, there wouldn't have been any. You know, if every time we did an atomic physics experiment we had to knew about quantum gravity, we wouldn't have made any progress in, in science, I would think. Um, so what you can do, luckily, is you can cross-grain. You can blur out, basically, these short distance UV degrees of freedom and just focus on the light or long wavelengths degree of freedom. Um, and so that gives you an effective theory that only focuses on the degrees of freedom that, that you can actually measure. Okay? Um, um, and we can do this even if we don't know what the full theory is. You know, even if we don't have access, we don't have enough high. You know, energy to produce these high energy states, um, we can still parameterize our ignorance and then do physics at, at long wavelengths. Um, then we can study how much how sensitive that physics at long wavelengths is to our ignorance at the at the short wavelengths. Okay, so of course this is also kind of how the history of particle physics has developed, because in particle physics, of course, by definition, almost we're building up physics from the you know from from the bottom up. We're building you know more higher and higher energy scale experiments. We're producing these low energy degrees of freedom one at a time. Um, and we're building up successively different types of effective theories. Okay? So very early in the history of particle physics, of course, the way the weak interaction was described was by, by four Fermi contact interactions. So the interactions between a neutron and a proton and electrons and neutrinos um, was, was assumed to be a contact interaction with a strength given by Fermi's constant. Okay? And that Fermi constant has a, has a size of order 300 GeV to the minus 2. Um, so if you, if you then estimate what the amplitude of such a scattering process is, it scales as the strength of the coupling times the energy scale of the process squared. So you, see, so you already see that this process, this, this, this way of describing things will break down at high energies because this, this amplitude here is unbounded. Okay? And so what happens just is that perturbatively quantum mechanics goes bad. You, know, you start violating unitarity in the, in the perturbative theory. Um, so either you have to have a non, either new physics has to appear or you know non perturbative effects have to cure that cure that problem. Um, and of course now we know of course what happens in reality is at sufficiently high energies you start resolving this contact interaction. There's a W boson that exchanges force between these these, these particles. So that happens at, at energies of order the mass of the W particle, and so we get the, the standard model. Um, but the standard model itself, we also think is a, as an effective theory, especially when we combine it with gravity, which itself, you can think of gravity very similar to, to for Fermi theory, um, with, a, with a strength that is, has an inverse mass scale, the Planck scale associated with it. That theory also breaks down. This time it breaks down at the, at the Planck scale. Okay, And so something has to replace that theory at high energies. And so for the purpose of that school, we're going to assume that that's string theory. Okay? Okay, so this was just a classic example how you build up from the ground up effective theories. Now I want to do the opposite and actually show you how you would construct an effective theory from the top down. Okay, and that's sometimes called integrating out. Um, so imagine, and this can be done if the full theory is known, when you, if you know the spectrum of all of the fields and then the actions between the fields. Then in principle, of course, you can explicitly do half of the path integral that you would have to do to get the partition function. 
Yeah? So integrate over all of the high energy degrees of freedom and get an effective, the effective action that only depends on the, the light fields. Okay? Um, and I just want to show you, illustrate how this works in a toy model because it may, maybe makes things more, more explicit. Um, and also to show you, because in practice, actually, we never do this path integral. We do some ma matching calculation. Um, okay, so this is the toy model. So I have a light two fields, a light degree of freedom and a heavy degree of freedom with masses little m and capital M. And I've added a self-interaction for the light field, lambda phi to the fourth. And then a cross-coupling between the light and the heavy field with strength given by this UV coupling G. Okay? So it's, it's not the most general renormalizable action you could write down. In fact, in a review by Cliff Burgess, he actually does look at the most general renormalizable action for, for, for two fields, and I've just truncated that to, to this subsector. Okay? Um, and so now you can match, basically, the, the answers that you would get in a loop expansion for the full theory to the answers that you would like to adjust for the effective theory. Okay? Um, so, for example, in the full theory, you can have corrections to the propagator of the light fields or the mass of the light fields where there are virtual heavy states running, running in the loop. And in an effective theory, of course, you shouldn't have any of those virtual states because they cannot be you know, of heavy states as external legs. They can only be. And so the external legs will always be just the light fields. And so you just have an effective coupling that you, that you adjust, such as to match the, the answer of the full theory. Okay? And you do that for every, every of these, 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 these terms that you can generate out of the interactions of the full theory. Okay? Um, and so let me just emphasize that there are two effects that these heavy fields can have. The first effect is that these heavy fields can renormalize the couplings of the renormalizable part of the, um, the, the, the IR, th IR theory. So as we, just, as we saw, for example, you can renormalize the mass of the light field. Okay? And so this would be the answer um, that, that you would get in our, in our example. Or you could renormalize the quartic coupling, and this would be the answer that you get. Okay. Um, and so this is done now in a in a renormalization scheme with a hard cutoff in Euclidean, in Euclidean momenta. Okay. Um, and so this already shows you one one important fact, and it's going to be relevant for inflation, for example, is that it's unnatural to have light scalars. Okay. Um, because this quantum correction here, if I add it to the bare mass of the of the light field. Um, it has a, naively, it has a quadratic divergence in terms of the cutoff of that, um, of, 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 of that effective theory. Um, we have to be a little bit careful because this quadratic divergence here is, is scheme dependent. Okay? So actually, if we were to do this calculation in dim reg, for example, we wouldn't have this quadratic divergence. But what we would still have is we would have, to have this physical dependence on the mass of the, the heavy field. And since both of this unphysical power law divergence with, this, with the cutoff and the physical mass squared dependence with respect to the physical mass come with the same coupling, it's sometimes convenient to just use the, the cutoff dependence as a proxy for, for the dangerous dependence on heavy, field, on heavy fields. Okay. Um, okay, so this is standard. This is part of the, the hierarchy problem in the standard model. Um, the second thing that heavy fields do is that they add new interactions to the low energy theory, uh, new non-renormalizable interactions. So remember that for the, for the light field, I had just a mass term and lambda phi to the fourth. But now, since I have these couplings to the heavy fields, I can generate higher dimension terms. You know, here, for example, I've generated phi to the sixth. Okay? Um, but by dimensional analysis, these have to become suppressed by a scale, and that scale after renormalization is going to be the scale associated with the heavy degrees of freedom. Okay? So this makes sense. As the heavy fields become very, he very, you know, very massive, um, these extra terms, in fact, decouple and become irrelevant. Okay? That's why these are also called irrelevant, irre irrelevant operators. Another thing that this example already shows is that everything that is allowed is compulsory. So all of the terms that are allowed by the symmetries of the full theory actually do appear after you integrate out the heavy degrees of freedom. And so in this example, the toy model that I was giving, the only symmetry that we had was a, a Z2 symmetry acting on the light degrees of freedom. So I should generate everything consistent with the, with the Z2, Z2 symmetry. And if in detail you go through this example, indeed you will generate all the terms consistent with that symmetry. So you have an infinite series of higher dimensional terms, some of them with derivatives, some of them without derivatives, suppressed by appropriate powers of the scale of the, the heavy physics. Okay? Um, so this, there's a second expansion here, which is an expansion in terms of energy scale over the scale of the heavy physics. 
So at low energies, energy is much lower than the scale of the heavy physics. Um, this expansion truncates, and higher dimensional terms become less and less relevant. Um, and so usually, at a finite level of precision, you can live with a finite number of these, these extra terms. Okay? Um, so that was just an example how you would get an effective theory from the top down. Um, usually, because in inflation, we actually don't know what the full theory is, we apply effective theory from the bottom up. So we just parameterize our ignorance about the heavy physics in terms of the most, um, about some, 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 some general theory. Um, so so how, this is how this would work, for example. I first of all have to identify the degrees of freedom that are relevant at a given energy scale. And so um, either you do that experimentally by measuring just at a given energy scale what the degrees of freedom are, um, or you have to make an assumption what degrees of freedom you think are relevant at an energy scale that you haven't measured yet. Um, then you have to identify the symmetries at play at that energy scales, basically the rules with which you are supposed to construct the, the, this, this effect of Lagrangian. Um, and then you write down the lowest dimension operators compatible with the symmetries. So you try to construct this, the, the sum of, of operators made out of the light, the light fields. Um, and this operator has, you know, this, okay. Um, so this, 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 in this notation here, I'm summing over the most general set of terms that I can create out of the light field degrees of freedom. They come with dimensionless coefficients, which are called the, the Wilson coefficients. They come with a dimensionful scale, which is the scale of the heavy physics in, in reality. Given that we no, don't know the, the scale of the heavy physics, we just parameterize this by some cutoff scale, cutoff scale lambda. OK, um, okay so this was my mini review of effective theory. Um, any, any questions about this? Okay, probably most people know this since, uh, uh, okay, um, good. I just want to make sure, so I told you the basics of, of effective theory, both from the top down and from the bottom up. And now we actually want to apply this from the bottom up to, to inflation, where we actually don't know what the UV theory is. And we just want to see how sensitive inflation it really is to, to these extra corrections that we might add to our, our inflationary theory. Okay. Um, so for inflation, what we have to do is, at a minimal level, we have two types of degrees of freedom. We have a scalar field phi, which we call, we call the inflaton field, with a potential, um, which we might postulate to have some form, but we should also see how sensitive that postulated form is to these extra corrections that we have in this effective theory. But in addition, since we want to describe dynamics in, an ex, you know, in, a, in, in cosmology, we also have to couple this to gravity in some way. Okay? And so there's a second degree of freedom, which is the gravitational degree of freedom. So we know we, at minimal level, we have to write down an effective action for this scalar field phi coupled to, to the metric. Um, ah. And so, um, and so we can now ask in this, in this particular example, what are these, what's the scale of the cutoff, for example? And then what are the Wilson coefficients for the individual operators? Um, and of course, it, you know, the, the short answer is that we don't know precisely, of course, what the cutoff is for, for this effective theory. Um, but we can, we can put bounds on it, and so just from the fact that gravity becomes non-unitary at high, high energies, um, we usually have to believe that this cutoff scale is below the, the, the Planck scale. Um, otherwise, we have to have some non-perturbative treatment of, of quantum gravity to take, take care of this. So the most, most, most extreme we can assume about this cutoff scale is that it is the Planck scale. Okay? But of course, then in usually um, attempts that UV complete um, quantum gravity We'll do that in a weakly coupled way at energies you know, below, the, below the Planck scale. And so in string theory, for example, this cutoff scale is below, below the string scale. Um, so we'll just we keep this as a free parameter that, that you would you know, you determine from experiment, or you, you ask how sensitive you are to this, um, but consistent with these, with these restrictions. Um, OK, and then the question is, what's, you know, what are these Wilson coefficients? Which, which of the operators are allowed? What kind of symmetries is it, is it natural to impose on, on, on this theory? Um, and here, this is, this is a bit tough because we know very little, of course, about the couplings of, the, of anything to the, the Planck scale degrees of freedom. Um, and so in order to decide how big these Wilson coefficients are, we ha would have to know what the UV couplings are that, that connect uh, you know, the inflaton sector to heavy, heavy degrees of freedom. Okay? Um, and again, that's something that is quite, quite uncertain. Um, the, 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 the two extreme possibilities are that, you know, if you don't have a good reason, um, 
you assume Wilsonian naturalness and say that the UV couplings are of order one, and therefore also the Wilson coefficients of all of these operators are of order one. Okay, I'm allowing everything consistent with the symmetries with a strength that is of order unity at, at, the, at the scale of the, the heavy physics. Um, but sometimes there is a good reason that actually that, that, um, that tells us that some of these couplings are forbidden or very small, and if this is the case, then you can also explain why, um, why some of these Wilson coefficients are, are, are suppressed. And in fact, it turns out for inflation, we have to have something like this. We, uh, if, if we assume perfect Wilsonian naturalness, then actually we, we typically destroy, destroy inflation. Okay? Um, so one good reason is, is to have internal symmetries. Um, so for example, if the inflaton field had a global internal symmetry, then it would forbid all types of, these danger, of dangerous couplings to heavy degrees of freedom. The inflaton sector would be totally decoupled from any of these heavy fields. And integrating out the heavy fields you know, wouldn't affect, it's just a separate sector that doesn't affect at all the, the low energy effective action. Okay? Um, of course, this cannot be a perfect symmetry because then we wouldn't also forbid the inflaton potential in the first place. Okay? Um, so this has to be, but you, you might think that this is an approximate symmetry that is weakly broken and that weak breaking parameter actually still you know, restricts um, uh, the couplings in the low energy theory. Um, in quantum gravity, in fact, this question of having a global internal symmetry becomes a bit more subtle, in fact, because there's some, some approximate lore that continuous global symmetries are, are not allowed, um, don't exist in, in quantum gravity. Um, they're not very sharp arguments, I mean, the, the, um, but, but you know, for example, one simple argument is about black hole evaporation. If you imagine starting off with a very big black hole and you throw some, some matter into this black hole with a, a finite global charge, okay? And then the black hole slowly evaporates. Since the black hole is very big, at first it just you know, emits very low energy photons, basically. Those photons do not carry baryonic charge. Okay? And, by the time, um, and uh, by, by the time the black hole is small enough to, 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 to emit you know, heavy, heavier states, maybe its mass is in a sm so small that it's less than the mass of the baryonic matter that I've thrown in to begin with. And so this process non-perturbatively was violating conservation of of global charge. Okay. Um, so that's an argument that, 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 that tells us that it cannot be an exact symmetry, but it could be non-perturbatively suppressed. So we don't know, you know, the coefficient, this G, it doesn't, it tells us G can't be zero, this UV coupling can't be zero, it could still be small because there's some non-perturbative suppression. Okay. Um, but there are things like this, and in string theory there are more, more detailed arguments that also you can prove as a theorem almost, perturbat in perturbative string theory there are no global charges, things like that. Okay. Um, and so this is not a, a very strict rule, but it, it, it cautions us to, to not assume very strong things about symmetries at the, at the Planck scale and to ask whether we are sensitive to assumptions that we make about uh, Planck scale physics. Okay. Um, okay, so let me just quickly show you and then wrap up why this, why this matters. Um, so Leonardo yesterday already showed us, explained you know, slow roll inflation. So inflation happens on a flat potential if these two conditions hold. So epsilon has to be smaller than one in order for inflation to occur. Eta has to be smaller than one in order for inflation to last. Okay? Both of these two things have to, have to be satisfied. Um, and in addition, in order to get scale invariant super horizon fluctuations, this eta parameter, in fact, has to be much less than one. It has to be of order a percent, because that's the amount of deviation that we allowed from, from, from scale invariance. But the deviation from scale invariance is proportional to these two parameters. Okay, um, so even observationally, we know that these parameters have to be much smaller than much smaller than one. But you also notice that the eta parameter you can write as a ratio of mass scale to, to expansion rate to Hubble scale. So we require a small hierarchy between the mass scale of the inflaton and the, the only other scale duration, which is the, the, the expansion rate. All right. um, so now you can ask how sensitive is that ratio to higher dimensional corrections? And so one natural operator to add to the potential, of course, is just the size of the potential itself times, times phi squared. Okay? Um, and then I'm suppressing this by the, by the cutoff scale. So this is a dimension six operator that unless I have an exact shift symmetry, I should be allowing to write down. But you can see, of course, that if I do write this down as, as a mass to the field um, of order the Hubble scale, or you know, bigger than the Hubble scale, in fact, um, so its, its effect on the eta parameter is large. Okay? Um, and in fact, it's even dangerous if I'm doing the most extreme thing and I'm assuming I can push the cutoff scale all the way to the Planck scale. 
even in that case, this thing doesn't become, become you know, uh, sufficiently small. Okay? So that's something quite unusual because usually if something is suppressed by the Planck scale, in, in a standard model there are very few examples where we are really sensitive to Planck scale suppressed uh, operators. Proton decay is one of the few, you know, one of the rare examples, I think. Um, so so this, is, this, is, this is kind of striking that, and this is indeed a very, typically a very small correction to the, to the scale of the potential. Okay? Um, if the field value is small, smaller than the Planck scale, then this is a very small correction to the height of the potential, but it does sensitively affect the shape. Okay? And that's how, the, how inflation becomes sensitive to, to Planck, scale, Planck scale physics. Um, Okay, there's a, there's a second type of problem that is not as universal. This, is, this, is, this first one, this ether problem, affects any model of inflation, I would say. Uh, the second one is, 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 is significant for a particular class of inflationary theories. And in particular, those are the, the, the interesting ones that produce observable levels of gravitational waves. Okay? So it turns out that in a model that produces gravitational waves, uh, the field has to move over a super Planckian distance. Okay? Um, and actually, if I have five minutes, I'll show you quickly. Um, because this is an incredibly simple, <laughs> simple result. It fits on this slide in, in, in totality. Okay? Um, so this is called the life bound, and you can derive it in three lines. Um, so let's see how this happens. So remember from last time that we were calculating the amplitude of scalar fluctuations. Okay? It had two contributions, the, just the, the expansion rate at horizon crossing for a canonically normalized field times this conversion factor, which depends on the speed of the inflaton field and the expansion rate. And then the tensor fluctuations were much simpler. They only depended on the, on the expansion rate and the normalization coming from the Einstein-Hilbert action. Okay? So those are the two expressions that we found for scalar and tensor fluctuations. Then you can compute this famous tensor to scalar ratio that we have seen in the NSR plot. Um, and you can rewrite this, 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 the result that you get in terms of basically the speed of the inflaton field if measured in numbers of e-foldings of, of inflation. Uh, just rescaling time by the expansion rate, you get the, the number of e-foldings of expansion. And so if you ask how far the field moves per e-fold of expansion, that's directly related to the size of this tensor to scalar ratio. Okay? Um, so in particular, you can integrate this. So you can, t you can find what's the total field excursion from the time when the CMB scales were exiting the horizons, which were the largest scales that we can, can observe, until the time when inflation ends, which is around here. So this is what I define to be the total field excursion during inflation. So it's the following integral, integrating from 0 to 60 E foldings, um, the square root of the tensor to scalar ratio. Okay. Um, and then in slow roll, the, here I've indicated that this tensor to scalar ratio in principle can depend on time, if the, you know, if, if the potential cha shape changes with, with time. Um, but in slow roll, this dependence has to be second order in slow roll. So it's a very, very weak time dependence of the of the tensor to scalar ratio. Okay? Um, so if you assume that it's stri strictly constant, you can pull out this tensor to scalar ratio and integrate just over the total number of e-foldings, and you get this, you get this result. Yeah? So you get, you get a direct relationship between the amplitude of tensor fluctuations um, and the size of the field excursions at, when measured in, in Planck units. And the normalization of that amplitude happens to be 10 to the, 10 to the minus 2. Okay? Um, so this 10 to the minus 2 is very striking. I don't see a deep significance to it, but uh, because if you think about where... So first of all, just as a fact, I can tell you that we will only be able to observe gravitational waves in the near-term future, saying maybe the next 10 to 20 years, if this 10 to the scalar ratio happens to be bigger than 1%. Okay? Why that is has to do with astrophysics. Okay? It's just because there's emission from dust in our galaxy that contaminates you know, our attempts to look for polarization in the CMB to see these tensor fluctuations, for example. Things like this. So very detailed aspects of our galaxy and astrophysics and so on determine this number. Yeah? The fact that we have to be above this number to see gravitational waves. Um, but, and then, curiously, by this relationship, this astrophysical number is related to the Planck scale, okay? um, which happens to be a fundamental scale, of course, in, in quantum gravity. Okay? Um, so this is a, a nice coincidence. It could have been, uh, could have been otherwise. Um, <laughs> sorry? Yeah. At, lot not, at, at least not easily. Yeah? 
If, if r happens to be less than 0.01, yeah, it's going to be tough. Yeah? I mean, some people are proposing experiments that can go down to 10 to the minus 3 and so on. Yeah? Um, but that's, that's pushing it already. Yeah? Um, and that's, that's, ma that's making an assumption about how, a how good we will be able to deal all the messy with all the messy stuff. Yeah? It's not a question of getting sensitivity in our experiments. We can just dump more detectors on the... Yeah? It's limited really by kind of cosmic events, not by how well we can build you know, satellites and, and, and so on. Um, so often when people may do these estimates of that we can go down to 10 to the minus 3, these estimates are often based on quite optimistic assumptions of how well we can deal with all the stuff that we not, don't have so much control over. Um, and just taking the raw sensitivity of our experiment and pushing it to the limits. Okay, so that's it. Um, but yeah, optimistically, yeah, I'm saying if you're young enough to wait 30 years, <laughs> then you will get lower than this maybe, but um, some of us might not. Yeah. Uh, um, not really, yeah. Uh, maybe this, if I have a couple of minutes, this is an interesting point to make, I think. Um, because, so that, yeah, you might ask, are there other ways of measuring these gravitational waves? Mm -hmm. Okay, either through large-scale structure or even to the direct detection. Mm -hmm. So there were, a recent, you know, a couple of years ago, there was this this proposal called the Big Bang Observer, where you were building basically a rescaled version of LISA, some very big, um, you know, actually these these detectors were separated by, I don't know, okay, let me not say a number, I forgot, but some very, you know, very big device that would measure gravitational waves from the Big Bang. Okay. Um, the problem with doing something like this is that if you wait all, you know, 13.8 billion years for these gravitational waves to get to us, these gravitational waves, the energy of those gravitational waves redshifts. Yeah? So you need to catch them early. If you wait until today, they're very min you know, their amplitude goes down as one over the scale factor. Okay? And similarly, I think for large-scale structure, their amplitude just has redshifted by so much. And that's why, again, the CMB is so fantastic. Because actually what the CMB does is it takes a snapshot of these gravitational waves at 400,000 years rather than 13.8 billion years, okay? Um, so I, I find it hard to imagine that you will be able to do better than something, you know, where you actually took a snapshot of that high amplitude, you know, relative, it's even, even there it's tiny, and now if you wait another 13.8 billion years, it has really become very small. Um, but yeah, the Big Bang Observer was managing to do something, you know, with this level of sensitivity, if you push these experiments to the quantum limit, and it's, 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 that's 50 years in the future or something, at least. Yes, but actually, but the CMB is a Z of, you know, a thousand times bigger than that. Yeah, and so yeah, so it's it's it's, and if you, I don't know how you would have to, you have to evaluate the strain of those gravitational waves, and that probably decreases by one over the scale factor, but then maybe you have to square it, so it's scale factor squared, and then it's a factor of, you know, ten to the six, or something. So, um, it's going to be tough, I think, but I'm not the expert. Yeah. Okay. Um, so why why might why might we worry? Let's just coming back to our discussion of just coming back to our discussion of UV sensitivity and effective theories of of inflation. Why might we worry about this fact that the field moves over such a large distance when when measured in fundamental units of quantum gravity? And the reason you might worry is that because in the absence of a good reason, I told you that by Wilsonian naturalness, I should be adding everything consistent with the symmetries. Um, suppressed by a scale that is not bigger than the Planck scale. At most, it is the Planck scale. And so, in some quote-unquote, the generic effective theory expectation is not such a shape, yeah? but it's something that has structure on the order of the cutoff scale, at least. Yeah? Because you have this infinite number of terms. Each of them becomes order one at the cutoff when the field value is uh, of order the cutoff scale. Adding all of those together, you know, unless you con they conspire to do something miraculously, um, it produces something like this rather than something like this. Okay? Um, and let me emphasize here that fine-tuning here is not an option. I didn't say this for the ether problem. In the ether problem, in fact, it's, it, it's, there's one dangerous term, this dimension six operator. You, you can imagine fine-tuning a way that one dangerous term with, an, with some compensating, compensating effect. Here, that's not an, not an option because you have an infinite number of those terms, and it's a functional fine-tuning rather than just tuning one operator. Um, so you need, you need to really talk about this, this kind of class of theories in terms of a fundamental symmetry that is protected enough at the Planck scale to, to disallow all of these things. Okay? And tomorrow I'm going to explain a proposal for what, what such a theory could be. Could be. Okay? Um, okay, I'm almost in, in time. Um,
Good. So, you know, if you, there's spillover, you can use that. Today I actually finished, so I'm proud. Um, but I'm happy to discuss anything this afternoon. Um, this is my final slide, in fact. So I just want to emphasize again that we didn't know what this cutoff scale was. Um, just, but arguments about perturbativity of quantum gravity suggest that we shouldn't take this cutoff to be bigger than the Planck scale. And most likely, in any attempt to, that we have in string theory to be complete quantum gravity, of course, we have the string scale and other scales that come, become important much below the Planck scale. And so typically there, the cutoff scale is lower than the, the Planck scale. And all of these problems actually become, become bigger. Okay? So, but I just want to emphasize that every, all of this persists even if we make the most optimistic assumption and allow ourselves to push this scale all the way to the Planck scale. Okay? And so this is what's going to motivate me tomorrow to actually look at this in string theory and ask, are there good reasons to forbid these terms? Are there symmetries that are strong enough to forbid, you know, to even in the presence of these quantum gravity laws of no global continuous symmetries and so on, um, you know, to give us control over theories in the presence of all of these, these corrections?